It is somewhat ironic because I am a pediatrician. In the old days, people in, uh, who went into clinical immunology, immunology was thought of as a disease of infants and young children. And that's how it all started. And so what happened was we had this idea that disease, primary immune deficiency occurred only in infants and children. And amazingly, that thought still exists, although it is beginning to change. And that's encouraging. But we'll go over some of the things as to why we have such a hard time. It's interesting, the idea did a survey about 15, 20 years ago. At that time, it took about seven, seven or eight years to make the diagnosis. After teaching everybody and emphasizing how important it was to look for new deficiency, it went up to 12.9 years. <laughs> and we will see some of the reasons for this, and I have spent a lot of my time now changing from a laboratory rat, which I was. I spent my first three years in the lab as a, as a, as a teacher, and I got annoyed when I got consulted, or I got annoyed when I had to see a patient. And now one of the joys that I hope to transmit to you is that it is a privilege to take care of patients and I hope this persists in medicine. So what we'll do, I'll have to figure out, is this thing actually causing reverberation? Okay, so let me move that. My kids are old enough, I don't yell at them anymore. Uh, I do have a loud voice. I don't know, for some reason, my vocal cords got long, but the height did not increase. <laughs> <laughs> so just, um, I'm from Hawaii, mahalo nui loa, means thank you very much to these uh, individuals. We have to put a little uh, disclosure. Uh, I have uh, some grant funding from some of the institutions that you see there, including UCLA. I lecture at UCLA and at the Military Medical University of Hanoi. I have been a board member of a few of these organizations and have, re have been consultants uh, in the past. Now, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm a little bit younger. I had all, older cousins that forced me to see Elvis Presley movies and whatnot. I, I, I was more a product of the 60s. But it's hard to imagine, and I don't know if some of you have gone. I've gone to the Eagles, I've gone to some of the old, like Bruce Springfield, and I'm blocking on the one, Sweet Caroline. You, Neil Diamond. Neil Diamond. I saw him when he was young, and I saw him when he was old. Yeah. And I'm thinking, my goodness, you know, 50 years have passed. And those guys really look old, but they can still rock. <laughs> the problem is, you know, what happened to us? Well, time flies. And so the outline of the discussion, you know, all of us probably came out like that brand new BMW that you see out of the showroom. And then somewhere along the line, we end up like that old beat up BMW that you see there. And you know, the point being that one, and I'll show you the data because this really caught us off guard. Primary immune deficiency is not rare in the geriatric age group. It's not rare in adults. In fact, we would argue it's more common in adults than it is in children. But what caught us by surprise was that it was very common in adults, and we'll go through some of the reasons. Also, adult immune deficiency <coughs> patients have antibody abnormalities, and that may make it difficult. I'm not insulting children because I was a pediatrician, but if a kid comes out and gets really sick, it catches your attention. Or if he comes out and he looks different from everybody else, that catches your attention. What is the problem with adults? Well, adults generally put so long, and then somewhere along the line, they get complications. And one of the things that we'll talk about is antibiotics have sort of obscured the fact and covers up the fact that we have immune problems. And I've had patients who for 40 years were treated with antibiotics, landed in the hospital with pneumonia, and then finally somebody says, hmm, Maybe you got one of those rare birds. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I don't know, can you hear with or without? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so what happens is that in addition to difficulty in diagnosing because they get covered up with antibiotics and others, they may also have problems 
that they do not necessarily start out with infections. They, have, they can have chronic GI problems, inflammatory bowel disease. They can have arthritis, Sjogren's. They can have cancers that can present, lymphomas, and then they turn out to have CVID, for example. So there may be many other problems. The other thing is that they may have complications and other coexisting diseases which impact and complicate PID. And I would argue that now with the treatment for a lot of the uh, young kids, it is far easier to take care of babies and children than it is adults because they have so many other things going on. They have arthritis, poor eyesight, diabetes, heart problems, high blood pressure, kidney disease, and on top of all of that, they have primary immune deficiency. And I think some of the, I'm 72 years old now, but some of the white hair is because of taking care of some of these individuals <laughs> who have a lot of problems. Now the other thing is that aging normally causes deterioration and loss of function. This is a natural process and will be reviewed. This was known forever that when you get older, stuff doesn't work. Your eyesight doesn't work, your voice gets low and froggy, yeah. you can't hit the ball 300 yards like you used to in your imagination, you probably never did, but you tell everybody else you did and now you've hit 150 <laughs> yards. And this is a natural process. The other thing is that older patients have unique issues involving care, and this is something that we forget. As we, as we get older, the problem is that we need more help. And I can see some of these old stubborn guys. They don't want to go to the doctor, they don't want help, and they don't want to take medicine. And I speak from experience. I don't know about, you know, why men live longer than they should. It's because they're married and the wives nag them. And my wife does that to me all the time. But I think that's a critical issue. There are problems with self-management, and with the single pair, we have a greater issue. And this is one of the concerns. When you have one pair, in this case Medicare, you have complications because there are certain rules, and the patients don't always fit into that. So let's look at the first case. We have a 61-year-old female retired nurse, very bright, and she kept telling the doctors, that something is wrong. She had at least 16 episodes of severe bacterial pneumonia since early childhood. She had operations, ENT operations, mastoidectomy, that should have sent off alarms. And during the past 15 years, from about 40 up until 61 or so, at least two bouts yearly of pneumonias requiring antibiotics, sinus infections, admitted to the hospital requiring antibiotics, had bronchiectasis, which happens after long-term inflammation of the lungs. And this is something that we have to prevent. Seen in the hospital in consultation, found to have common variable. We did the antibody test, low antibodies, no function, and in addition, her T lymphocytes, which help coordinate, fight, and regulate inflammation, was very low and abnormal. So she had the double whammy. She's almost like a skid and adult skin, and actually these are now being described. Not congenital, but somehow acquired. Developed cardiac arrhythmias, congestive heart failure, developed a parotid lymphoma, got chemotherapy. And you say, woe is her. Actually, she is a brave individual. She's doing exceptionally well now. Wow. And because I don't want to depress you, especially in the afternoon. Here are two cases, and I'll go on a fourth one. But this one is a 75-year-old woman with CVID on IVIG. The husband was a, was a physician. She had intractable sinopulmonary infections, developed inflammatory bowel disease, which is a complication. And this is the way we have to think about immune deficiency. I think we should get rid of that word, maybe say immune dysregulation, because it's the immune system that is not responding to harmful things, over-responding in the case of inflammation, not shutting itself down after they've mounted an in, uh, inflammation or response to some agent. And then finally, why in the world would somebody sneeze and get eye itching to a cat? Well, that's because the immune system has made a mistake. But it's all part of the four continuum. And I think if we think about this 
in it this way, it's easier to understand. And what made her, again, I'm telling you, because look at all the complications these individuals with, with immune deficiency develop. And in this case, she had inflammatory bowel disease, she developed cancer, and she had other complications. And it is incumbent. One of the things that I, I have absolutely become determined is that we have to recognize these things early, or we have to recognize them, or try to think about them before they even occur, so that careful monitoring is possible. I have caught now about two dozen patients who develop lymphoma, but we caught it early. We we're doing protein electrophoresis. They developed a gamma spike. We sent them to the hematologist oncologist. There's a thing called AMGUS. In other words, they have the spike, but it's not meaningful at the time. And then some of them later developed lymphoma, was caught quickly and treated. And I think it's this anticipation. You don't drive in LA without kind of knowing where you're going because you can get into big trouble. And it's the same thing. These patients are like maps. You have to know what can happen to them. Anticipate. You know, what was the old saying? You know, three kinds of people and the one you don't want to be is the one that said, what happened? <laughs> but this is what happens all the time in medicine. And it shouldn't be because we have enough experience to know what might happen in patients so that we can prevent. And the old saying, the longer you go, the more trouble you can get into. And so that's a critical point. Now, the interesting thing about her was that because they were giving her an immunosuppressive, in this case, a TNF-alpha inhibitor, and nature did not make this to make the pharmaceutical companies wealthy. I mean, TNF-alpha is a very, very important protein that regulates inflammation. And when you shut it off or you mess around, what was that old thing, don't mess with Mother Nature? So when you start doing that kind of stuff, you better look, there's a trade-off. And the problem is the people who take care of these diseases, the cancer doctors, the rheumatologists, the GI, the neurologists, they are worried about serious disease. And so, what is that, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, is their attitude, and I don't blame them. But the thing is that you have to think about some of the complications you might run into. And I think this is where the clinical immunologist comes into form. The idea that you're looking over the shoulder, you know what might happen, you tell these individuals what might happen. Who knows whether the cancer may have resulted because of the TNF-alpha. But she developed ascites, we were, she had inflammatory bowel disease. The treatment would have been high dose IVIG. We couldn't give it, so we gave it by Hycuvia. IVIG actually is a treatment for inflammatory bowel disease, and Dr. Hanslox and others had done it before the monoclonals. So we did that, it worked. Another case Addison's disease, CVID, spinal stenosis, she had problems walking. Her husband was a retired Nebraska Supreme Court justice, unfortunately, and he was wonderful. He took care of her, and you know, notice all, all of them are guys. And the reason is that we're doing men's liberation here. Because <laughs> there's always a woman taking care of the guy. Well, here the guys are taking care of the women, and they were wonderful. Retired Supreme Court justice, he took care of his wife like a charm. Unfortunately, he got a stroke. So what does that tell you? Here's another problem, where we have somebody taking care of somebody else, or we have people taking care of themselves, and then something happens. And this is a thing that a lot of doctors don't understand, the federal regulators don't understand, the insurance companies don't understand. And so we need to bring this to their attention. The patient had complications, moved to a nursing home, and incredibly, the nursing home would not do it. And this happens all the time. This is not new. Now, this is the one that I think, you know, everybody, every doctor has cases that they remember. And it bothers them. And this one bothered me. This was a 78-year-old wonderful, kind woman. She was like a saint, and she married a saint. She had a long history of lung disease, chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, sinus problems. The pulmonologist, after years and years, referred. We made the diagnosis. We treated. And lo and behold, she got healthy. She gained weight. She became active. 
And every time they came, they were sitting like two peas in a pod. They went backwards to 1950s, I think, sitting in a rumble seat holding hands. I mean, a wonderful couple. It was a joy and a privilege to take care of her. And the husband helped with the subcutaneous. And she thrived. And then incredibly, he developed Alzheimer's disease, which sometimes happened. And then the roles reversed. She worried about him, whereas before, he worried about her. I don't know if guys are stoic or what, but it bothered her. And I saw her wilt away. She stopped smiling, and she died. And this bothered me. So then we began to say, how many elderly patients are we following in our group? And you saw we follow about 320 patients throughout the 11 state area with gamma globulin. Who takes care of them? What diseases do they have? And how does that affect their primary immune deficiency? And how are they managing? And I guarantee you, nobody knows, including the government. And I think one of the crusades that we had I'm a product of the 60s. I didn't burn down stuff. I did, really. <laughs> but, but we're still radical. And that is to get the government to do something or get institutions or organizations recognize this problem. So here it is. We follow a little over 300 patients in an 11-state area. And so I thought maybe I was following only I thought I was only following 20 patients, older patients. Laura Rohi, who some of you know, did a check, and it turned out we we're following 80. I said, I can't believe that. So I called Ralph Shapiro, a good friend at the University of Minnesota. Ralph looked. He found 80. I said, we said, we don't believe this. We called Mark Stein down in Florida. Florida has uh, retirement people and whatnot, and Mark had 100. So between the three of us, we had 260 or more. So we wanted to see. How were they as a group? Did they have other concomitant serious infections? What was the impact? Could geriatric patients understand Medicare and other third-party pairs? Who, were help, well, who was helping them? And in addition, it turns out that we found out nobody knows. And we have a consortium of 22 independent immunology clinics throughout the country. We have a registry. We follow probably about 3,000 patients, but trying to get people to put stuff in the registry is like trying to tell your kid, make the bed and, and, and eat cereal or eat vegetables. But we did put in 778 who were an IG replacement. And the question was asked, what is the breakdown when we look at them in 10-year increments? In other words, less than 10, et cetera, all the way up to more than 80. And much to our amazement, 40% of the patients receiving gamma globulin were over 60 years of age, and only 11% were under the age of 20. That was an eye-opener for us. We never suspected that. And the other remarkable finding, and this has been reported by the Germans in the last year or two, is that in children, it's predominantly male. As you get older, who knows why, it becomes predominantly female. And I'll show you some slides. I have to apologize for the slides because it had the figures on, but we could not uh, show those. Can you imagine 86 out of 778, or well, 11% were less than 20. 388. Uh, or 50% were between 20 and 60, and 304 out of the 778, or 39%, were over the age of 60 getting gamma globulin. And you ask most people, they would not know that. And I would argue that we are in private practice, we see the broad range of patients, whereas I would argue at UCLA, we would only see kids, but we would see the very rare patients. And so I would argue that ours may be a good look. So what does that mean? Almost 90% of the patients on IG replacement were adults, and 40% were more than 60 years of age, and more patients over 80 years than there were patients less than 10 years old. That is amazing. I mean, we're amazed. 
We sent this thing to the CIS and it's an abstract. I guess they were amazed because they gave us a blue ribbon. <laughs> you know, no grants, no anything, you get blue, blue ribbon. <laughs> but I think it's interesting because this year at the CIS, US, US uh, IDNet did the same thing. They looked at older patients over 65, but they looked at everything. And it turned out they reproduced our information. And in addition, there was maybe one or two percent with granulized site problems, a few percent with combined T and B cell, B cell problems. And so most of them have gamma uh, antibody defect. So what? Well, the so what is because this can be treated. How do you treat T cell abnormalities in older people or in adults? Not easy. But we have gamma globulin, we have antibiotics, we have careful management. So in my opinion, patients should do well, in my opinion. If they don't do well, it is because of our oversight. Now that's condemnation of the medical system, but I share the blame. I never realized that myself. Okay. Now, let me, I'm going to point this out because, unfortunately, I couldn't reproduce this thing, but I just want to go over very carefully. Here you have, this is less than 10, less than 20, less than 30, and this group is over 80. So these are by decades. And you can see several things. I don't know why they did it, but blue is, is women and red is, red is guys. Uh, this must be the new age. I always thought blue was boys and red, red, or red was girls. But you can see several things that I said. Up until age 20, there are more males than females. And you can see the total incidence. It starts flipping when you get to about 30 years of age or older. Here you can see all of a sudden more males, more males and females, all of a sudden more females than males. And then you can see this thing becomes bigger, wow. bigger, and bigger. I mean, that's amazing. The second thing you can see is look at the skewing of the patients that are older. It is absolutely amazing. The thinking is that this should be like this and then come down like this. It's the opposite. It's like this. And I would argue that that's why oftentimes we don't think of the diagnosis and we don't make the diagnosis. And we'll go on a little bit more to talk about the details. Okay, so what is the incidence of PID in the elderly? Nobody knows, including the government. The IDF is doing some surveys now. What type of immune deficiency do they have? Nobody knows, but it is predominantly antibody. And the USD Usernet is starting to collect data. How many of these individuals are receiving gamma globulin? Nobody knows. How many are receiving IVIG versus sub Q? Nobody knows. And we all know that IVIG is riskier in the older population. Subcutaneous, I'm not making a pitch for anything, but subcutaneous is much safer. What is the trade-off? The trade-off is they do it at home, and a lot of times they can't. And what is our system? Our system is we write the script, somebody from Florida mails it out to you, nobody cares whether you get it or not. And the thing can be sitting on your porch and not known. And then maybe if you're computer literate, somebody will say, well, look online, because there's a YouTube video to show you how to do it. And then if you call with a question, it's like calling the airlines. You know, somebody will be with you in the next three days. And how is that going to help? So these are issues. If they are on IVIG, what are the risks? Most doctors don't know. If they are on subcutaneous, are they self-infusing? We don't know. How many people, you ask any doctor, how many people do you have on sub-Q who are older? They don't know. You ask the government how many people are on sub-Q, they don't know. And it almost makes you wonder, does anybody care? And the thing is that out of mind, out of sight. Well, out of sight, out of mind. 
And this cannot be, and we'll finish up with a few slides to say why that cannot be. Are they doing it properly? Are they doing it regularly? Much to my amazement, because our office calls the patient all the time, and we have a process where we write a limited script, and I learned that from Dr. Ox. He was complaining to me, his patients don't come back. And the reason he just wrote it. Mine is, I write for six months, and if you don't come back, it doesn't happen. And so it's a lot more work for us because, of course, we have to keep, but it gives us the idea that, number one, they're doing it, and number two, we put it incumbent on the home infusion company or the hospital or somebody to get laboratory studies so we can monitor that. And most of them are not monitored. Do they have other diseases? How does the aging process affect primary immune deficiency? Nobody knows. Isn't that amazing? So here are two ends of the spectrum, kind of like the car. <laughs> you know, and if you see that baby driving, you better get out of the way. Although, you know, with now self-driving cars, you never know. But with infants and young children, the immune system is naive, it's learning, it's immature, and it's developing. One of the consequences, of course, increased susceptibility to infections, poor response to vaccines. That's why we give them three, four, five shots. And they have increased allergies. With the elderly, the immune system actually wears down, just like our eyes, just like our bones. Now when I climb up to change the light bulb, I don't jump off the counter like I used to. And so what happens is that it gets worn down, it doesn't function well, they have increased susceptibility to infections, poor response to vaccines. Mm -hmm. And we recognize that. Why is the influenza vaccine four times stronger than the ones other people get? Why is the varicella zoster, the shingles vaccine, 20 times stronger? It's because the older we get, our immune system wears down. Now superimpose that on primary immune deficiency to start with. You get the double whammy. Throw in diabetes, which also causes immune suppression. And you can see the cumulative factor. And unless you recognize this, we as physicians and healthcare givers are in big trouble. And I would argue we don't recognize that. Okay. I don't want to get too technical because I'm sure you've heard a lot of speakers. Uh, Hans Ox is like an older brother to me, but when he talks, my head spins. <laughs> he makes something very simple, very complicated. <laughs> I love Hans, but... But the point here is that if you look on the left side, the young, in the bone marrow, they make a lot of healthy cells. That's the take-home message. And those healthy cells come out, and you can see them. They come out, they go to the thymus gland, and Dr. Steen told me a long time ago, the thymus gland is like the school, it's like the college. These naive, pre-committed cells go to the thymus, and they learn what to do. They become mature. And then they go to the periphery. So there's two stopovers. And it, it makes sense. They go to the thymus. They come out from the bone marrow and elsewhere. They go to the thymus. They learn to become T cells or B cells, mainly T cells. And then they go to the lymph nodes in your throat and whatnot. They populate that area. They're, 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 they're cells, but they're still not quite sure what to do. And then along comes group B strep. Along comes adenovirus or something. And then all of a sudden, they see it in the lymph nodes. They trap it. They learn that this thing is not supposed to be there, and that's how they work. Now, what happens in old people? Well, their bone marrow wears out. They don't make enough cells. Just like I played basketball with my grandson <laughs> last month, and in my mind, I thought, you know, I could still dribble the ball, make jump shots and everything, and I thought I was going to die. <laughs> well, same thing. What happens to the thymus? It convolutes, it gets wrinkled, and looks like a prune. The cells go there. They don't become mature cells as much as you can see. 
And then when they go to the peripheral cells, the lymph nodes, the lymph nodes, they don't do a good job. The cells go there, they don't respond as well as they're supposed to. So it's sciescence. They're getting old. And this is the problem, because that now makes them extremely susceptible to infractions, okay? Show you one more uh, kind of more technical. I promise this is the last one. So what happens with age? Well, you have not only sciescence, but you have long-term inflammation. You have breakdown in cell function and proteins. So you can see at the left, the cells are robust. They're doing their job. You have the proper kinds of cells on the left. And as you get older, you have chronic inflammation. The B cells don't work as well. You have flipping of the proper kinds of cells and they don't work well. So what is the result? Increased infections, influenza. Influenza is not good in old people. The pneumococcus, strep pneumonia, is not a good thing in old people too. In fact, when I was a medical student a few years ago, the doctors used to tell us that the strep pneumonia or pneumonia was the friend of the elderly because they had poor function. It made them sick and they passed away right away. They did not suffer as long. That doesn't happen anymore, but the immune system is still defective. We have vaccines, we have antibiotics, and that's what helps them, or helps us survive. Increased malignancy, increased autoimmune disease. Amazingly, in healthy older adults, 22% had positive rheumatoid factor, and 14% had elevated anti-nuclear antibody, which is a rough marker for making antibodies against yourself. So this goes up. They fail to make enough immune cells. The structures which help cells to differentiate fail to develop and do their jobs. Cells that are made don't work as well, and cells don't respond to signals or directions as well. Women, you know this. You tell your husband, do something, can't hear. If you don't, they can't understand. It's kind of like the old golf joke where you had four guys playing, three couldn't see where the ball was, one guy could see. So they hit the ball, the guys who couldn't see hit the ball, and they asked the guy who could see where did the ball go, and he says, I can't remember. <laughs> Isn't that like ourselves? They don't remember. And that's why we get sick. That's why we have autoimmune disease. That's why we have cancer. Okay? So nobody knows the trouble I've seen, and that's what happens with our cells. And you can see, here you have cells uh, not destructing properly, so causing inflammation. Uh, they don't die like they're supposed to, uh, or get rid. Why do we still fail to recognize primary immune deficiency? We don't even recognize it in children. How are we gonna recognize it in adults, which is far more complicated? In children, we're getting better. We have track screening as well as genetic testing that helps a lot. Not only do we rec not recognize PID in adults, but worse still, we do not understand the unique problems that this age group has that I've talked about. Okay? Antibiotics obscure the diagnosis. Now you can see that kid back in the 50s. He's not happy. He's getting a penicillin shot. And I remember when I was a kid, you coughed and you sneezed, and the first thing you did was get a shot. So, I mean, I hated the doctor like a passion. I mean, <laughs> but penicillin saved millions of lives. I mean, look at the bottom. Thanks to penicillin, the soldier from World War II will come home, and all of us soldiers will come home. Can you imagine where we would be without antibiotics? But the miracle of antibiotics has delayed or obscured our ability to properly diagnose primary immune deficiency. It covers it up. You get a bronchitis, you get sinusitis, we give you antibiotics. The thing goes away for a little while and then maybe comes back. And then it goes away and it comes back again. Now imagine if we had no antibiotics, you would die. But because of antibiotics, and this is not to take anything away from antibiotics, but it makes our job of recognizing primary immune deficiency in adults and older individuals harder. The other thing we will talk about is the attitude of doctors and the healthcare service. And I remember when I was young, a young doctor, 
I was so old, don't worry about those old people. They had a normal life. They're going to get sick. Don't waste your time. I don't know if anybody's a doctor here, but I mean, I'm not telling you anything new. This attitude still exists. Not in that degree. But why bother doing a lot of stuff? I would argue that's wrong. Okay, misconceptions. Primary immune deficiency is a disease of children. False. Primary immune deficiency is rare. We cannot diagnose primary immune deficiency. False. We cannot treat. False. Especially in adults because it's antibody. Most of them have antibody deficiency. It's inexcusable not to look and not to treat. And I remember, you know, um, a number of my partners were allergists. A couple of them were older than I was. And this is why well, you know, I never saw immune deficiency. Well, hell, they saw thousands of patients. They had. Finally, Fred Kichel, who I look at like an older brother as well, he calls me up. He's all excited. I found one. I found one. I found one. I said, <laughs> If you looked harder, you would have found more. <laughs> and he started to look. And my other partners who are allergists started to look. And it's amazing. The ENTs are looking now. The pulmonologists are looking. The GI people are looking. Why? Because we tell them to look. And I remember, you know, UCLA is kind of this snotty place. So. First, when I left UCLA, they said, why do you want to leave for? Why do you want to go there? And every time I went back, you're still there? Why are you still there? And then they saw the numbers of patients we had, and this is like, disease occurs in Nebraska. I said, excuse me, disease occurs all over the place. You just have to look. And I would argue it may be easier to look in Nebraska because people don't move as much as L you know, LA. You, know, you see them once and then you don't know what happens to them. In Nebraska, you see them once and if you don't get them well, they call you like, hey, you didn't do anything for me, Lord. fix me up. <laughs> and so we look. So we're going to finish up. This is a slide from the Mayo Clinic, very important. And what it showed was that if you look back in 1976, very immune deficiency was rare. And then you can see how it's being recognized more and more. And the slide on the, uh, the table on the right, the graph, is very important. What does it say? 80%, 78% in the Mayo Clinic series turned out to be B-cell abnormalities. So here are the problems, failure to recognize in adults, failure to consider that adults with immune deficiency or other presentations may have primary immune deficiencies. Antibiotics, like I say, mask the diagnosis or delay it. Assuming the pulmonary diagnosis, I mean, how many of the pulmonologists, of the doctors, who see patients over and over and over again. Oh, they got COPD, they smoke, they're, they're farmers, they breathe in, hey, what do you expect? Well, once in a while, some of them might have problems. And like, why would that nurse for over 50 years have problems and not be diagnosed? Okay. What makes a geriatric patient different? Again, failure to recognize concurrent diseases, failure to recognize the impact, and Medicare, the savior, is a problem. Issues, multiple organs, aging, IVIG is a higher risk because of heart disease, kidney disease, vascular disease, clotting. IVIG cannot be infused rapidly, particularly in older individuals. And I have a lot of grannies who say, hey, you know, we've got to speed this thing up. And I say, granny, <laughs> settle down, granny. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to be the perpetrator of your demise or your illness. Sub-Q is safer. The problem is an infusion technique. Supplies may not be covered. It's more expensive than IVIG. The frail or physically limited cannot self-infuse without a spouse. How many of us know that there's somebody helping them? We don't know. They cannot infuse uh, regularly. Medicare is extremely complicated. Let me just show you this. 2019 is not the 1950s. I mean, can you imagine when I, I'm from Hawaii, and when I left for college, my friends would come on the plane. Can you imagine? The planes were half full at that time. My friends would come. 
they'd get on the plane, we'd talk until the plane was getting ready to shut the door, and then they would make the announcement, all of those who are not supposed to be going to California, get off. <laughs> now you can't go near the airport. It's not the 1950s, so the healthcare system has gotten a thousand times more difficult. How shall we proceed? We have to recognize that. We have to look at the effects of concomitant disease. We have to find out how and where geriatric patients are being treated. They have to monitor. We have to work with family members because they're the ones that are ultimately responsible. Somebody has to be responsible. And now, we, you know, I'm 72 years old. I don't know what I'm going to be like at 82. So if I'm fine now and I have PID and I'm giving myself self-infusion, what makes you think that a couple years down the road I'll be able to do it? So these are the kinds of things that we have to think about. How can we assure that they're being treated consistently, safely, effectively? How can we ensure that they are complying with treatment? How can we help to circumnavigate the morass of Medicare and other bureaucracies? And how do we help out with the cost? A lot of the elderly on fixed income. You have to choose between eating and paying the mortgage and medicine. And many years ago, I had heard about this. And with the big swine flu outbreak and bird flu outbreak, we were going to give lectures in Vietnam. And so I went to the pharmacy to get Tamiflu. And much to my amazement, it was $400. I took out my credit card, but there were three elderly people in front of me. And they said, I can't pick it up now. And that made an impression on me. That this is something we have to be aware of. Okay, why bother diagnosing in the first place? Well, obviously it may be more expensive if we don't diagnose and treat properly. Failure to diagnose and treat may cause chronic disease, like bronchiectasis, chronic lung disease chronic heart disease, et cetera, and premature death. I am of the old generation. A physician's responsibility is to diagnose and treat the patient to the best of his or her ability. I strongly feel that the only client or the only one that we have is our patient. Not the companies we belong to, not the insurance companies, not the pharmaceutical industry, only the patient is our sole client. And I hope we never forget that. Okay? And finally, this is the United States of America. How are we to be judged in terms of our health care? And words that we can live by. Whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. And I think that is so. If we do not take care of the people that we neglect, and things that are not valuable because you're old. Put grandma on the iceberg. I don't think we can do that in the United States of America. And Maya Angelou, I think a hero is any person really intent on making this a better place for all people. And I think this is something that I've tried to live by. If you want to learn a new Hawaiian word, there it is. Po'okahi kai ilaoliki ana. Put your paddle in and join the effort. And you can see the things that we need to do. We need to recognize, we need to learn about it, we need to know the needs, and we need to educate, and we need to take care of patients better. Not just babies and children, but our older individuals who made America what it is. You know the Tom Brokaw's greatest generation? My father was one of those. He never talked about the war. The only time he got mad was when I didn't eat. And he says, well, you know how many people are starving? That's the only time he got all upset because he saw people starving during the war. And so the point is, put the paddle in and help. Okay? So